Hi guys, Nick here with BitGalaxis bringing you a new video on Unity 3D game programming and today we're going to talk about hover physics and how you can implement a system to create hovercraft. And to start out I want to talk about some approaches that you might be able to take to implement a hovercraft or a system to make a vehicle float. And the obvious first choices really are just to use standard colliders. You can attach wheels to an object and you don't have to give them any kind of visual presence in the game. They're just there. Um, they can hit things and collide like normal wheels, but you just don't give any visual indication that there actually are wheels there. And that's a pretty good, simple trick to making something look like it's hovering. Uh, and you can even give it spring forces and things like that. Um, now you will have like friction in, in as well and you can remove the friction. You have a lot of options. It's a really simple choice. Um, but maybe you don't want to do it that way. Maybe you have some reasons for not doing it that way. Maybe you don't want it to seem like there's wheels there. Um, whether or not the players actually can tell that, uh, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I don't. depends on how you build your game, to be honest. Um, another option that you can use is just flat out using a sphere. Put a sphere, a sphere down and then having uh, the object stick to that sphere and follow it around um, is another method. Uh, and this is one that I saw was used by Kenny uh, and he used it just to create vehicles that kind of like an arcade style vehicle racer But you could also put hovercraft on there and I think he even does in this example So that's one example you could use now Another approach you could use is ray casts and forces and how you would implement this for example with a single ray is You would just put a ray cast down to the ground detect where it hits and then you push a force up and so what that will do is depending on how far down it goes it has a force going up it'll push it up if it goes too low and you can even detect the angle of the ground and so let's say that the angle the normal points out to kind of like up and right a little bit like 45 degrees you can make the objects rotate to match that angle now that's not necessarily good because let's say you are uh, between two valleys, like let's say you're in a valley and there's two angled objects, then your object's going to angle to one, and it really might need to be maybe even flat, like it's right, right in between the two, um, and it shouldn't be angled one way or the other. So the other way that I would recommend, or the way that I did it, was I used multiple uh, ray casts. So you have, in my case, I just had four, and they go down, they hit the ground, and then uh, they push the forces up in each of those locations. Now, the benefit of that is the, um, the vehicle will then kind of act like a car, but it also doesn't have wheel colliders on it and things like that. So how should we calculate forces on this? Um, and what I would say is, is you're going to have to do some formulas and some math, and there's actually going to be another video following this because I wanted to explain that in this video, and then I realized this gets pretty in-depth and maybe more than we're looking for right now. So if you just want to see how to do it, this video is perfect for you. If you want to see how we explain why it's doing what it does, then the next video is the one you'd want to watch and that'll be dropping in two weeks from today. So calculating forces, how much force should we apply? And um, to kind of go through this, well, first we need to talk about gravity. By default, Unity's gravity is negative 9.18 meters per second per second. Um, so that negative 9.81 um, actually tells us how much gravity we need to force up. So gravity is negative 9.81 meters per second per second. And in our fixed update, we're kind of applying that same standard. It's 9.81 times your mass. If you have a fixed update and you take a vector up that is 9.81 times the mass, then you're going to cancel out gravity and you want to make sure it's at the center and the object will just float and it's as simple as this you have a rigid body you grab so you grab that rigid body object at your start right so rigid body equals our get component rigid body and then in fixed update we say rigid body add force at position 9.81 f times a rigid body dot mass times vector 3 dot up and then we are wanting to apply that at the center of mass on the rigid body. So our rigid body has a center of mass property. That's where you apply that. If you were to do this, it actually would um, make the object float. So I'm going to demonstrate that for you now. Okay, so here I have this setup. It's already in play mode, but I've got this ball in this scene, and it has a sphere collider, a rigid body, and this counter gravity script. And on this counter gravity script, I have this anti gravity force 
value, it's a float, and this is the actual uh, counter gravity force that we're applying. So we basically are saying negative 9.81 is gravity and we're forcing up 9.81 every fixed update. So the ball is gonna stay there. Unless of course something hits it, then it's gonna change. But right now, there's only two forces, our up force and our down force. Now if I decrease our up force, you start to see that the ball floats or starts to fall. And then if we increase it, it starts to float higher and higher and higher. Um, and so as we change this value, you can see um, the, if I make it less than 9.81, it falls, and if I make it more, it increases. So there is a very simple method that we can see right there, just demonstrating that 9.81 is the default unity of gravity, and if we set a force up times the mass, it'll either float and just hover, really, not even move, um, or fall if it's less than it, or rise if it's greater than. So that's the simple way of doing it, and the simple demonstration of how we can prove that all you have to do is apply the mass times the gravity value. And if you want to see all of that code that I used from that previous example, here it is. You can plug this into a script, attach the script to an object with a rigid body and a mass, and you will get the same results as you just saw in that demonstration. So now for calculating forces, there are a lot of ways that we can calculate forces. Um, and really we need to talk about what's the best approach and really for your game it's what feels right now what's my approach like I said earlier it's the four ray cast and I'm using what I call the modified hooks law with dampening now like I said earlier um, I wanted to explain the code or the, the calculations uh, but that's going to be an in-depth video again the next video dropping in two weeks from today um, and why did I do that? Um, because for me, it's what feels right. Um, and I also can give it some adjustable rigidity. And you could probably do the same thing with the wheel collider, but I don't think, um, I couldn't quite get the, the feel that I wanted with it. Um, it didn't feel quite as floaty, I guess is what I should say. Um, just to give you an idea of how I arrived at the, the formula that I ended up using, um, a lot of it was just what does it look like, but I also did graph out several different formulas and, and tested each of these and how they would work. And uh, this is my graph. What I really had focused on was with a spring at a length of 10 um, and a strength of 100, what kind of force would be applied. And the modified Hooke's Law, it it's, goes up to 150 back here when the spring is com fully compressed. And you might be wondering, well, why is that? What's, what's going on there? And again, I'll get into that later, but basically it actually relies on, uh, the dampening effect relies on how much the spring was compressed in a previous state. And so let's say that the spring did go from 10 to zero. That's a very immediate change. And so for that to do that fast, we actually wanna apply much more force because that means that we're falling a lot faster. Um, and so we should apply more force. So dampening makes a lot of sense if, from that perspective, uh, and it actually does look the best. Um, all these other formulas that I tried, even looking at other videos, I, I don't know how people make this work typically, but using formulas I saw from other tutorials, they all bounce. They just keep bouncing. So these other three formulas, without that dampening, um, they all like just keep bouncing up and down. They never stop. So I have to apply a lot of dampening to account for that. And if you guys know, like, how, what's a better way of fixing that, let me know. But I'll talk about that in the next video if you want to see more details. So I will jump into a demonstration of how our dampening and our forces work right now. So here you can see that I have nine hover trucks, basically. And to kind of explain how these are set up, this back column has the least amount of dampening. And this middle column has a moderate amount of dampening. And this front column has a lot of dampening. The back row has very low strength. The middle row has a medium strength and the, the front this front row has a lot of strength. So we've increased the strength. So this one has the strongest springs that also have the uh, most extreme level of dampening. Um, and I think it's like almost five times the level of dampening um, as these first two. But what you can see here is by adjusting these values, all the same code, just different value set for the spring and dampeners. And there's four springs on each. But you can see that when they first fell, they all kind of just did these little bounces differently. And so um, I'm following just this one, the, the top, you know, the, it was basically the forward front most 
uh, vehicle and because this is the one I prefer the most in terms of how it works and I think it's mostly because I gave it enough power to actually hold it very strong and very strong dampening to actually keep it kind of you know flat uh, but you can see here we're just kind of bouncing around and the dampening we kind of you know kind of hover a little bit um, but you see uh, we have very different effects for each of these and uh, it kind of looks <laughs> pretty silly at points with uh, vehicles that bounce around and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in adjusting these things but you can see here like we just go over this little ramp we kind of float over it and land and there we go and then some of this is you know <laughs> land there um, so the dampening does have some pretty good effects to be honest with you I think it looks fairly good um, when you kind of go up a, a, a hill you go up the hill normally um, but if you go up a wall you're kind of flying off of there so now you might be wondering well you're just flying around you're not even stopping and it's because there's no real side friction it's just it's hovering so the forces you apply there's no uh, wheels to stop you there's no friction on there it's all just uh, basically dragged from the air which is very minimal um, I don't even know if uh, there's I don't even know if I have drag set on any of these things so if we go back to the rigid body uh, and look at these um, yeah we don't have any real drag on this it's all like it's one so basically it's just going to keep going uh, once you start moving it but again watch it bounce that that far back left one the weakest springs and the weakest dampening you can see it just kind of bounces up and down but it also hovers real low um, and this one has the strongest springs so these are equally strong springs but the dampening level is much higher here and much lower there so you can see even just the dampening alone makes a big difference in, in the behavior uh, of how these <laughs> things fly but anyway that's really it so we're going to jump into showing you guys some code for this stuff um, and in the next video um, we will actually um, go talk through that code talk through about how it works and, and what it's doing and maybe graphing out why it looks the way it works so code the part one of the code is talking about what's happening in fixed update in fixed update we've got our rate cast hit and we're just calling it hit and basically we're just seeing if there's a hit so if our physics rate cast and we're just saying from our position which is the spring each of these devices each of these vehicles had four springs the spring itself the position of the spring we're going to um, ray cast down so our taking that transform and the direction is vector 3 dot up minus so that means that means down um, and then out hit so we're taking that hit information and we're putting it out to hit so all the information we're getting is uh, basically a pointer uh, that only has one direction and that's an outward pointer and it's dropping that information in the hit kind of like dropping it in a bucket um, and then um, we're gonna get the uh, we're gonna only go as far as the length so um, in this case each of these had a length of four I think is what I established so we had a public variable length we're sending it out four um, and then I have this float force amount equals hook slaw dampen. The function I have is hook slaw dampen, and I'm passing it the hit distance. Where did it actually hit? And then with that, once I get that calculation done, it sends back a force, um, a float value of the force amount. So on the rigid body of the truck, I add a force at the position of our spring. So this object transformed up. So my position, and I'm just pointing up from my position and then we're doing a force amount so times our force amount so when I said a hundred some of them were six thousand some of them were three thousand because the, the truck itself I think is a thousand so uh, transform that up times the force amount which you can change as a variable um, and then uh, then we're using the force is being applied at our position the position of the spring so um, then if there is no hit we're just going to say we have a last hit distance. Remember, we're using dampening. So one of the things that dampening requires is that we know um, how much the spring has been compressed in a certain amount of time because we're resisting that compression. Um, so the spring has a strength, like let's say it can push back 6,000 at, at um, zero, but it also has a resistance to, to compression within a time frame. So it's like, oh, it's more than 6,000 if you went from 10 to zero within, a, within one fixed update so um, so we got to account for that so I say it's 1.1 if there is no hit so that way we're saying oh we're really um, this is kind of cheating because you do want to find like the actual speed but it's negligible in my opinion um, and this is a quick dirty calculation so 
the code part two, this actual Hooke's Law of Dampen, um, we are grabbing that hit distance. Remember we got that from, that's the hit dot, let's go back one slide, that um, hit dot distance, we're sending it that. So on hit, we had a distance. That hit dot distance is being passed to that Hooke's Law of Dampen. So then we get our force amount, and that's our strength, which is the strength of the spring, which is a public variable on the code. Then we're taking that times the length minus our hit distance. So we're saying, okay, we have a length of four and we want to find our hit distance. So we really have, um, like, let's say it's one, right? We're down to, um, we're down, our hit distance was one, the spring was four. We've compressed 75%. So we're basically saying, okay, we've got three, strength times three, plus our dampening. So dampening, again, considering the constraints that within a certain time frame or resistance, we're a little bit more resistant if it's a really fast hit. Um, that dampening uh, times our last hit distance. So we actually track that every time we hit, we're finding the last hit distance minus our current hit distance. So our dampening value is trying to say, okay, we've got maybe 6,000 dampening and we went from four to three or four to one on this last hit. So it increases, that dampening value increases because it was a faster you know, motion. So we're more resistant to the change the faster we go. And we're less resistant to the change the slower we go from one to the other. So really it becomes a floor of like, let's say we were at two and we remained at two, we're still gonna apply um, half of our um, half of our strength overall. And again, I'm going to graph this out next time. If that's confusing, this is the code. If you want to throw it in there, you're going to get the same results I get by messing around with the values. If it doesn't make sense yet, next time I'll actually draw this out. Um, then I also say our force amount um, is a maximum of either zero or our force amount. And the reason why I do that is because it could be negative. If, with dampening, you can actually have a negative force. And I didn't want that uh, because that would imply that the object could actually get pulled to the ground. Um, so, but the spring uh, is not fixed to the ground. Does that make sense? So if the spring is in the air, then the spring shouldn't be dragging the object down because the spring has, uh, really it's not a spring, it's not even an object, it's a hovercraft. So there is no weight for a spring to pull it down. There's no gravity locking it down. So when that force equals negative, I just want it to be zero because um, there's no reason that it should force it down. Um, it should always just kind of adjust upwards. And then our last hit distance equals our current hit distance. So the very last thing we do is now, okay, we, we are done calculating with the last hit distance. Now we're the new hit we're done for the next cycle. Last hit distance is gonna be the current hit distance. And then we return our force amount. And that's how we do our calculations. So anyway, anyway guys, that's all I had for today. I know that some of this code was complicated and you may be itching to find out more about how it actually works. And so in my next video, I'm actually gonna cover explanations of that and visualize that, put some more graphics on what's actually going on with that instead of just a simple, here's some code and here's some bar graphs. I realize you probably want to understand a little bit better than what I provided here today. And I'll even tell you how it's wrong because it's not all true to real physics, um, but it doesn't have to be. That's the other thing. You know, when you're programming games, if it's something like you want to be super realistic, oh yeah, what I did here, that's not what you want. But if you like the way it looked and you just it looks fun and you want to do it, do it that way because it's, you know, um, borrow from, from this. I don't I don't care if you use this code. Um, there's other code I saw that I thought looked good, but it didn't quite do work the way I wanted it to. Um, and for some reason, I can't get like other code to not work right. Um, for example, I saw one that, that was just using the power function and it just kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing when I did it. Um, so I had to use my method to stop the bouncing. Um, and you may have that same exact experience. It's quite quite frustrating until I learned about the dampening. So anyway, that's everything for today. If you guys like this video, please hit the like button. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you.